Hello everyone, uh, thank you for joining us today for our Object Matrix and Extensives webinar. That is my clock going off in the background telling us that it is 4 o'clock and ready to go. Um, my name is Mark Haberfield, I'm the pre-sales engineer here at Object Matrix. Um, on the line we also have Richard from Extensis. Hi there. Hi. And Nick, our sales manager as well. Let me tell you a little bit about Object Matrix. Hello. We are recording the uh, uh, webinar so it can be played back later and we'll obviously share the slides with you if you need them. But if you've got any questions as we're going along, pop them in the chat window. Um, or please do feel free to unmute yourself and we'll have a chat uh, as we go along through the webinar. So quick look at the agenda. We'll just do introductions to both Object Matrix, uh, Extensis, Portfolio and Matrix Store, um, insights into the integration, uh, discussion about the challenges, and then for those of you who still want to stay around, we'll do a quick demo uh, of the two working together as well. So I'll hand over to Nick to give us a quick company presentation. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, so Object Matrix, we're a software company from uh, sunny Wales in the UK. And we've been doing um, cloud storage uh, since 2003 as Object Matrix and the founders, myself, uh, John, and Francisco were doing it before with, uh, with EMC. So we've got a long heritage in object storage. Um, and as mentioned, founded in 2003, so we've been doing it a long time. Um, and we've got a real sort of heritage of helping companies to modernize their archives and their workflows uh, to ensure they can access content from anywhere um, and ensure they always have access to their content. Sorry, in the background, someone's now decided to start mowing the lawn next door. So uh, apologies for that, everyone, if you can hear it. Uh, next slide, Mark. So our product is called Matrix Store Cloud. It's based on Matrix Store Object Storage, and it effectively enables you to get on with things that are meaningful to your business instead of you having to manage media. It acts as a near line, an archive, disaster recovery, business continuity, um, and it's absolutely future-proof in scale and workflow. Also, it enables you to ensure you can access your data and metadata at any time in the future. And I guess if you take recent events into account, the ability to access your content from anywhere um, is really important. And as a company, we focus very much on media uh, and media workflows. But as you'll see, we've also got a very um, strong history in working in regulated environments. Next slide, Mark. So the product, I'm not going to sort of read through it all. Effectively, it can be deployed as a local cloud, so on-premise. It can be deployed in hybrid workflows where you have a little bit of on-prem and then using um, a managed service or public cloud also. And we also have in the UK uh, and soon to be in France uh, and the US a managed service or private cloud uh, offering that enables you to um, you know, have more of an OPEX-based uh, experience uh, to protect your assets. So what is it? It's an extremely scalable object storage platform, cloud-based, based on commodity hardware. It comes with very intuitive uh, interfaces. And also, we've done the work as an organization to integrate with sort of leading third-party vendors, uh, such as Extensis, with their um, brilliant portfolio products. It's got built-in smarts. And what does that mean? It means it's got uh, intelligence under the hood so that if you were to put um, a Adobe file or uh, an AS10 or 11 into it, it would automatically extract the metadata and make it searchable. And that's really important for ensuring you always have access not only to your content, but your metadata. Um, it's multi-tenanted, so you can have different departments, customers, or workflows on the same platform. And it's got built-in orchestration and automation um, at a basic level. Um, and then we have our APIs, which enable us to take advantage of other orchestration and automation platforms. Uh, the content security we take very, very seriously. Um, and our credentials within the uh, sort of regulated industries um, 
come from the fact that the product itself does a lot of work in the background to ensure that, that your data is authentic, protected, um, and is audited. So audits are a big uh, feature of the product. So any action that happens in a matrix or cloud is audited. So if that piece of content that's required in um, some sort of uh, uh, legal scenario or uh, has ended up on YouTube, we can tell you who accessed it and when. Um, we can prove the authenticity of a piece of content so it's the same in 10 years time as it was today. And you know we've got customers who've been using our product for an excess of 10 years and so we can, we can uh, talk to you about those stories if you wish to. Retention periods. I want to stop my data being deleted or changed until a certain period has passed. Now these are functions that have been used in um, life sciences and finance for many years. Just so happens working in file-based workflows and archive is very, very important to be able to lock down your data from accidental or malicious deletion. Being able to find stuff. If you can't find it, you don't have it. That's the same in, in any industry. But particularly in regulated industries, there are sometimes um, compliance regulations, either internally or externally, that mean you have to be able to find content within a certain amount of time. And so we've got all that and we built it in, and which is why even though we are a company that only focuses on video, we have many corporate customers from banks, parliaments, um, blue light organizations, etc. So I think that if anyone is uh, on the call who is looking for a, a very secure private cloud um, platform that's integrated into, uh, into the portfolio product, then, then you know, get in touch. We're sure we can help you. Um, Mark, I think that's the last slide from me. Oh, just deployment, sorry, apologies. So as mentioned before, uh, you can deploy the, the product in many ways. Uh, at the moment, the majority of our customers have been on uh, Matrix Store um, local cloud uh, on-premise. Uh, they've either done that and they've had other um, Matrix Stores off-site for disaster recovery and business continuity, which also comes built in with the solution. As I mentioned, we have our own Matrix Store cloud managed service in the UK and the, the customers are building for that as well. And also we can integrate with any sort of S3 enabled public cloud platform which means that you can have the best of both worlds. You can have on-prem and managed service, and then if you really want um, some sort of really deep archive from one of the big um, public cloud providers, you can do that as your belt and braces copy. So it's very much up to you as a, as a customer, whether you have CapEx or OpEx budget, whether you want to deploy on-prem or off, or whether you want to manage service. We have all of the uh, capability to service your requirements. Uh, Obligatory customer slide, uh, as I mentioned, we only um, deal in video, so we have news, sports, video on demand, um, and of course then some of the highlighted uh, um, customers there are banks and parliaments and uh, etc. So um, we, we've got, as I mentioned, between in object matrix about 17 years of working in regulated industries and prior to that uh, in our previous lives. Um, we've also got strong history in working in sort of organizations that need to manage data but need to do it in accordance with internal or external regulations. Great stuff. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, thank you, um, Mark. Thank you, Nick. Um, so um, a little bit about Extensys. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of Extensys before, we started off in the early days of digital print publishing, helping media organizations manage their digital assets. Um, what is a digital asset? Well, it could be an image, a graphic, a video, or an audio, audio file. It could be a, a document or um, even a font. Um, traditional print publishing and media companies have gone through some big changes, however, over the last 20 years, and especially so in the last decade, because content can now be delivered and consumed through new channels, and there's more competition. Um, the new channels have changed almost every aspect of human life, from how we meet people, how we buy our groceries, and how we interact with each other, and how we spend our free time. The fact is that we are living in a digital world. Digital content plays a really important part of the experience. Customers, regardless of vertical market, 
are voracious consumers of digital content. And what's more, they now expect organizations to have a stash of hero content. They don't just want product shots. They want lifestyle shots and video. They want shared content that shows the product being used, enjoyed, and experienced. So the point that we're making is that every organization is now a media company. It's just that for many of them, they're either not yet fully understood the value of their content or the importance of these new channels. For the corporate company, it's not just to engage with audience, it's externally, but it's also with, um, to, to share with employees internally, um, partners, distributors, and for, for blue lights, as we were talking about, there might be a legal obligation as well. Here at Extensis, when we talk about digital assets, we also understand the importance of typography and brand. Fonts matter, but they can also be difficult to manage. Creative professionals tend to collect large numbers of them and wherever they find them. The problem with collecting large numbers of fonts, however, is that no two different fonts can share the same name, making them difficult to manage. Activating the wrong font can lead to problems with reflow text um, and production delays. We solved this problem and we've grown to be known as a trusted experts in font management. When it comes to digital images, video and graphics, we take a consultative approach to support different customers as they discover the steps that they need to take because no two customers typically have the same needs and requirements. Over the past uh, years since I've been working for Extensis, I've really lost track to the number of times when we've been invited to meet with large and well-known brands, manufacturers, financial institutions, government departments, retailers, charities, museums, libraries, who don't have solutions to manage their digital assets or understand to how their employees relate to them. In fact, for many customers, they've not really considered that their digital files are assets. After all, in fact, as, as uh, Nick was saying, an asset is only an asset if it can be found again. We help customers through a consultative process to document their digital assets and their workflows to help them with best practice around file naming, metadata planning, and asset sharing. And we help customers develop a taxonomy and better understand the way in which people, their, their, their users, want to relate to that content. So I think we're ready to talk about the integration. Yes, great. Thank you for that. Uh, really interesting. Um, yeah, the integration. So um, the two products, Portfolio and Matrix Store, obviously seamlessly work together. Um, you can simply mount them. Um, your assets are stored in Matrix Store and Portfolio is the front end to them. The added bonus comes in that um, data security within the Matrix Store and also the replication. So one of our blue light emergency services decided to take Matrix Store and Extensis uh, portfolio together. Um, and we just spun it up um, pretty quickly uh, with delivering the, the assets uh, during the COVID period as well and got everything installed in a rapid time period as well. This particular customer also decided to take a full second location, a full replicated copy. So that's the data and the metadata all being replicated to a second Matrix Store at a second location. Um, and then if they just have a, a one-off short outage they could use one of the matrix store tools such as vision to quickly glance at assets and you know any quick things but if they feel they can have a longer a longer outage they've got everything backed up within the virtual environment so they can just spin up a virtual um, samba and a virtual extensis all from the backups and be up and running back to normal in very little time at all um, so a really interesting customer case that we've got out there unfortunately i can't name the exact service uh, but they are based in the uk uh, did definitely want all that compliance and auditing side of things. It's really important to them, um, as well as the seamless ease of access um, and allowing those multiple um, viewing and searching facilities throughout, along with the secure protected storage, disaster recovery, uh, and the option to tweak those workflows in the future should they need to. So let's go on to the questions then, the bit you actually come here for, the actual challenges for corporate video. Um, if I ask the questions, and everyone can answer me as they feel. 
So are all companies media companies these days? Well, I, I think Richard uh, in his uh, presentation said yes, and I think uh, our experience is the case as well. Um, you know, you've got banks and um, insurance companies bringing creative um, technology processes back in-house uh, for their sort of uh, advertising. You've got uh, internal training, um, internal communications, um, and they, you know, the vast majority of it these days is video. And so those companies uh, generally got very strong um, IT uh, departments used to managing um, email archiving uh, and documentation, uh, certainly content management, but you know, not uh, much experience in terms of video. Uh, and of course, as any um, production uh, engineer will tell you, the IT people know nothing about video. <laughs> so I think, um, you know, yeah, for me, every company is a media company these days. And, you know, even ourselves, we, we put out a lot of video content, good and bad. Um, and it's about how do we sort of manage that? How do we find it? And how do we share it? So that, that yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, from, from my side, certainly, um, I, I think there are some um, vertical markets where you'll find larger amounts of digital content. But from, yeah, from my experience, uh, you know, digital content is being used everywhere. Um, and I would also echo that and it's not about bashing the IT department, but I don't think all businesses are aware of it, and certainly not all IT departments. Um, how is it being created? Where is it being stored? How is it being used? How is it being referenced? How is it being uh, life cycled? Uh, because um, through, um, you know, regulation that, uh, yeah, there is a, a, a need to manage or better manage that content as it exists and being as it's curated. Um, and, um, and obviously that often brings the conversation around solutions that manage the content because um, digital asset management or media asset management for a lot of organizations, um, they've never actually encountered that term before. It's usually that they're looking for, you know, video library software or something. Um, so uh, it's still something that surprises me that some of these organizations uh, come to us and have, n have nothing. Yeah, not forgetting they all tend to use an off-the-shelf sharing platform as well, um, which uh, isn't always ideal. Yeah. So, why do more corporate organizations need video-centric workflows? Well, I think as, as, we've, just, uh, as we've just said, um, many of these organizations, if, if they've got any content management systems for documentation, they typically will try and shoehorn video into that. Um, and then they find that, you know, the network is crashing because people are trying to play full-res video through their document management system. Um, or they're simply piling it up on sort of generic storage and struggling to find it. So um, like, like any organization, corporate organizations need to get the maximum value out of their assets, including their digital assets. Um, if they're looking for those hero shots, they've got to know where to find them and when to use them appropriately. Uh, and also if they're able to use them for, from a compliance and rights point of view. So. There's no point in trying to build IT workflows to do something that has been done by the um, media industry and the media technology industry for the last 20 years, um, and certainly in, in the last five in terms of creating automation and orchestration um, to ensure that assets that are um, ingested end up protected, tagged, logged, and, and available um, for sharing globally. Yeah, um, I mean, from our side, um, we often have customers first contacting us because this content is there and they don't necessarily realize that they need a workflow. Um, and they usually contact us, often contact us after some kind of negative experience or epic failure in managing, using, or distributing digital content. But then uh, we also have customers contact us at the planning stage, and obviously that was what happened with uh, Blue Light we talked about, where they know that the amount of digital content is starting to increase or they expect it to grow exponentially. Um, and, um, you know, the fact is that the, the manual tasks 
in organizing a few hundred files in a folder structure. You know, most organizations can, can cope with that. Um, but as the quantity increase or the size of the files increase or the um, um, there's more pressures on a VPN connection maybe to, to have access to that uh, on-prem location, that actually things are uh, challenging, you know, things become more challenging. And, and so with more files being added and the realization that comes that you need something to help automate the, part, the, the workflow, the process of naming, tagging, and referencing that content. Um, so um, the driver could, or the, the catalyst could be that someone's wasted time looking for the correct resource and then they suddenly snap and think, well, I, you know, there must be a better way. It could be that, as I say, homeworking and you know, being, you know, accessing remote content through the constraints of a VPN connection is just too slow. Uh, so looking to make, migrate from on-prem to cloud. And, and of course, um, I've also come across horror stories where someone's used a, a, a video that they found on the internet or an image that they found on the internet, which they've realized isn't actually anything to do with their company and might actually be the, the content, content of a competitor or something. So we've all seen all sorts of kind of horror stories in the past from customers where they've realized that something has happened that, that they need to, um, to take, take control of this. Great. So can these companies download a MAM and just start working instantly? <laughs> I, I think many MAM companies say they can, right Richard? Um, well, the, the, yes, you can. Um, in much the same way, you can download and install, test pretty much any application these days. But actually, the success is only really in the implementation. Um, um, I think a better chance of success would be to recommend in, engaging with, um, if it's extensive, then our professional services team. We prefer to work with our customers to take a more consultative approach that involves a wider discussion with all of the internal stakeholders to determine what success looks like to everyone uh, with an interest in, in, in the project. And the benefit of taking that more consultative approach ensures that those people who will be using the system feel as though their voices have been heard and so they feel as though they're part of the solution rather than you know, part of the problem. It can involve uh, an amnesty to get that content, uh, you know, a content amnesty, getting people to reveal the, the, the sources that they're, or, you know, the shares that they've been collating themselves. Um, but um, uh, I think having a, a plan to understand the taxonomy is, is, is really, and be consultative is, is, is really the most important thing. Because um, whatever system you buy uh, or look at, um, you know, it's only as good as the implementation, I think. Yeah, and just to quickly add to that, I think that people um, sometimes will engage and, and sort of procure a DAM system or a MAM system um, and end up only using about 20% of the functionality because they only needed to be able to ingest, log, tag, and share. And right. I think that, um, you know, you need, you need to engage all of the stakeholders uh, from the end users through to IT and the CTO to ensure that you know the investment is going to be used and it's not going to be 80 percent of that investment just sat there not being used by anyone i think that that consultative approach um either if you use um sort of the uh, professional services from um people like extensis or if you um use you know we've got a lot of um fantastic uh of our fantastic channel partners on the call and they absolutely take consultative approaches to, for their customers because you know ultimately if they sell them just one big thing and drop it on them then they're never going to sell something again so uh, absolutely I think uh, I don't think anyone would really really just download a MAM and, and start working. Next question. Are there any governance or compliance issues that corporate organizations face? Yes, <laughs> uh, um, absolutely. Uh, I, le very little in the um, in the broadcast space, apart from having to hold on for some content for so many days after broadcast. But I think that's going to change. We've seen some cases recently where um, in the UK we have delightful shows like the Jeremy Carl Show, 
uh, and uh, someone unfortunate in a court case, uh, the validity of the, um, the footage was questioned. Now, you know, that means that people have to protect, share in a, in a compliant way the rushes that came from that, that shoot. And I tell you now, that doesn't happen. Um, but within the banks, within the, the insurance companies, they've all faced um, compliance regulation since Enron started shredding paper um, way back when. Uh, and so data in the business has to be immutable, easily found, protected, um, etc. And that is either from some form of external regulation like Sarbanes-Oxley or SEC 14A or the Department of Defense, or um, as many, if there's a, a company um, edict to look after data for um, one type of data, they'll generally try and uh, um, take the same approach across all of their data. So, you know, if a financial analyst is going to make a comment on Bloomberg and that subsequently gets changed, they want to know that they protected the original very, very well and in a compliant manner. Um, and in, in Europe, obviously, the management of content is also covered by GDPR. For, for corporate content. Um, rules exist to protect the individual, so it's important to understand how that relates to each business and to track consent when it's required. Um, the metadata, obviously, is important here because um, metadata, uh, whether it's a geolocation uh, that's been tra tracked on somebody's mobile phone or um, um, uh, another reference, you can, you can um, reference uh, a name or, or an address uh, in, is, is embedded metadata. So that's really important. In the US, it's a slightly different story. The state of California introduced uh, a rule called AB 375 as a law to protect the rights of the individual. And similar laws exist in other states, but they're not federal laws. Um, and obviously, um, that there's a lot to consider when you think about GDPR and how to abide by it. But Actually, the interest in managing content has, has we've seen an increase in uh, uh, corporate customers contacting us when they fear that actually they, their, their uh, libraries of content might not be um, GDPR compliant. Um, and we, we've got organizations who have gone to the trouble if they can't uh, generate a consent form for the individual shot or in photo, then actually uh, deleting those files uh, so that they're not available uh, because without consent uh, they shouldn't be used. Um, for uh, Blue Light, actually one of the projects was to, um, is that somebody could agree to their consent on GDPR but then later, later on decide that they wanted to remove consent. So the ability to um, select file of search and select and and remove those files from an archive is important as well. Um, I've actually written a, a, a blog about this on the extensis.com website, uh, a two-part blog, which talks about some of the challenges that organizations might have. Um, I can share that URL for that blog afterwards. Cool, great. We'll try and get it in the chat window. Good stuff. So what challenges do you see for finding content in the rising about a body camera? or CCTV footage? Um, I, well, I think this comes back to the, you know, the original question of is every company a media company? I think that typically uh, things like CCTV, um, there's a, certainly a law in the UK that they have to keep the footage for 30 days, um, at, you know, like in supermarkets and all the rest of it. But apparently the, um, those, there are people out there who know that and will make complaints after the 30-day period of, has expired. Um, at which point supermarkets end up paying out because they've got no proof because the stuff was deleted. So I think that you're going to see um, more of that footage being retained. They're going to want to be hold, get hold of it quicker. Obviously as well now all of the um, blue light services are pretty much carrying body cameras or cameras in car. That's all going to be protected, logged and, and made available and certainly you know if it's going to be end up being used in a um, in a sort of a court case, then obviously the validity and authenticity of that content needs to be proved as well. So I think the challenges are scale, volume, find, all those things. Um, location, where was, the, where was this shot? Uh, was it actually on the roundabout where this camera image was taken at the time of the incident? Uh, and certainly, you know, portfolio is, uh, from extensis is, 
fantastic at incorporating that sort of geotagging information in their system. So yeah, I think you know they face all the problems that most broadcasters face in fairness, Mark, and that is managing, protecting, and sharing in fairness. Yeah, I, I would certainly agree with that, Nick. I, I think also um, it's important to uh, the, certainly the speed of, of, of delivery is important uh, to help underline its value, not only for an internal organization, but also for uh, the sort of um, public acceptance of all of this content, uh, not only with obviously CCTV, but body one video. Um, still imagery, drone photography, and I think um, one of the challenges is it, it obviously, as evidence, um, it's it's important to remember that that content serves not only to protect the law enforcement officer, but also or the emergency response team, but it's also to protect the public as well. Um, and and I, I think um, the importance of this content still need there's a there's you know large percentages of percentage of the population who probably uh, really don't like the idea of living in a society where um, everything is recorded but the benefits of this kind of content when performing say a search for a missing person a you know, drone or, or unmanned aerial vehicle photography as it's often called uh, can help you know find missing persons over difficult terrain and, and so there's sort of a PR thing that needs to happen as well. So the importance of this content and the value that it has to the wider society. Um, uh, forgetting about the technology for a second, you know, we need to make people realize that there's real benefits from, from having this um, content there. Cool. Great, so how do we back up these databases of all this information? Well, I'm, <laughs> I, mean, I think there's plenty of IT solutions out there, um, you know, for backing up databases and restoring them. That's not new. I think what is new is making sure your metadata is also protected in another technology um, that's tightly coupled to the data. So da databases typically, you know, are the brain and they point to a storage location where the data lives. And if that link is broken then people will generally struggle to find their content when you're moving content um, between systems like portfolio and, and matrix store cloud from object matrix matrix store cloud protects metadata as strongly as it does the data so any metadata that's passed will protect and we can also automatically extract metadata which means in effect you're backing up your database should your database or your mam go down you still have the ability to search and find content using our interfaces. Um, and I think that longevity and future proof, uh, metadata future proof, um, that's what you like, is very important. And it's something that um, we co-funded a research project by the DPP in the UK into the future of archiving. And we, um, the, they interviewed hundreds of broadcasters uh, in the US, Europe, uh, et cetera. And one of the key topics was you know, we need to look after my metadata as much as my content, but make sure when we archive them, they're tightly coupled with the content because we don't want to have two systems managing the same piece of content and one relying on the other. So backing up the database, simple, backing up metadata and making sure metadata is tightly coupled with the, the content, slightly different and, and certainly something that um, our integration does for you. Yeah, uh, from the portfolio perspective, um, portfolio has its own backup that backs up the portfolio catalogs and preferences and, and user management settings. By by default, it does that weekly and can be modified and to 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 to, to back up daily or you know as it can the number of retained backups. Um, um, and um, it, it, the other thing as well, actually, with portfolio, I think it's probably pertinent to mention. It doesn't hold the metadata ransom. So, as Nick was saying, you know, having the metadata that is real value uh, within portfolio. If you wanted to and have the sufficient level of access, you can export metadata out separately as a as a as a text file. Um, so, um, yeah, um, portfolio is there to to help with the the portfolio database, but what it what it doesn't do is it doesn't back up the original media. That's where you would need 
uh, another backup solution to, 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 to manage that. Great. So what codex come as standard with the portfolio? I think this one's safely for you, Richard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, Portfolio is able to catalog and index a really broad range of different file types. Um, it's actually too big to, to list. It's, there's over, I think, 500 different file formats that we catalog. In terms of our support, it's whether it not only catalogs and um, thumbnails and builds a, a low resolution um, image of a, of a still uh, or a document, uh, but then with video, um, we um, portfolio will create a, a proxy. So when digital video files are added to portfolio, portfolio has a, an embedded media engine that creates a video proxy to the original file as an H.264 MP4. Um, options exist within the portfolio admin to the quality of these proxy versions and the duration. Uh, the default resolution is 480p. We, we typically keep it quite small just for delivery of the preview of the proxy. We leverage that over wide area networks so that somebody can play just the first two minutes or whatever uh, before downloading the original. But you can set it to be uh, on a per catalog basis up to um, um, uh, 540, 720 or 1080 p or even, even uh, to, to be 360. Um, so the duration by default is limited to to three to three minutes, uh, but that can be modified on a per catalog basis. Um, and then with documents, we'll um, index the text to PDF and Word documents and PowerPoints, um, and um, yeah, extract um, 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 metadata. And uh, it will also. Um, uh, it can be uh, the media engine can also uh, press this videos out. So if the original was 1080p or, or 2K or something, you can spin out derivatives from that on demand. So the media engine is multi-threaded, um, and will um, you, you can set it up in a cluster if you wanted to. If you have a lot of demand for creating derivatives from the original. Cool. Okay. Cool. I think we've done that one pretty much. Um, I think. Uh, the, the point just to pick on from Richard on that one, Mark, is, um, you know, if you're looking to move your content uh, into a um, private, hybrid, or public cloud platform, make sure that your metadata isn't held to ransom uh, and that your data isn't held to ransom so that it's in the format that it was archived. So in this instance, Portfolio sends us the data as it was captured or any derivatives with, with the metadata. We'll protect that in a non-proprietary way. And then if we push that to any public cloud bu buckets, we will push the data and the metadata in a non-proprietary way. So the, the future-proof access of, to your content you own is, is assured. Mark, before we go on to the demo, um, is if there are any questions, if people would like to ask them, they can ask some now. And of course, we can ask at the end as well, after the demo. But if there are any questions about you know, the corporate video environment versus, you know, because a lot of people on the call, I think, are here from potentially the uh, sort of traditional broadcast media space as well. Um, if there are any questions, please fire, fire them over. Um, otherwise, there will be contact details at the end. Um, what, one thing just to add about the metadata as well is that um, we can also understand, working sort of as consultatively, uh, understand, help to build up what is the minimum set of, of required metadata um, because obviously metadata exists in lots of different formats um, and including custom uh, metadata um, it's, it's possible to um, you know set a set a policy for your metadata and and also map it field by field so that sensitive metadata can actually if you wanted it to just be kept uh, within the dam as opposed to being embedded uh, you or it could be in both places and travel with the file so you can select certain pieces of metadata to not exist. An example of that, we've got a, um, an organization that looks after flora and fauna. Um, they did a, a project about rare orchids before they were using Portfolio. They realized that they were distributing um, images of these rare orchids in, in the wild where the GPS coordinates were actually included um, in their public information. 
So selectively purging metadata is an important thing to consider as well. Yeah, yeah, especially if there's uh, pictures of family and youngsters in there as well, I'm guessing. Yeah. Hey, hey Richard, this is, this is Brent with Synesis. I have a question for you. Yeah. On the portfolio product, just as a general rule, um, we, we have, uh, as uh, Nick was kind of alluding to earlier, most of our customers are traditional broadcast customers. But we do have uh, quite a few um, ad agency uh, customers in North America, and we, we've had to do integrations into their, their uh, networking and storage infrastructure. It's almost always been um, with Zynet. Um, is Portfolio a direct replacement uh, to Zynet? Is that something that we could uh, look at? Because we've had to do API integrations, and as you know, that's a legacy application. It's, it's, it's never gone smoothly. Yeah. Um, actually, I do know uh, we've had several customers move from Zynet Web Native to Portfolio over the years. I, th I think it might have been discontinued some time ago, but it was, or I believe it was. Um, it, it, I know it was very popular with, within agencies. And um, as so, I would say, yeah, pretty much the, the 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 functionality within portfolio is very similar to from what I remember of Zynet. Um, obviously, things it, have changed. I think most planes bought them and has kept it alive. It's still all. Right. It's still kept, probably because there's a big revenue stream for supporting it. But uh, right. um, it's it's all over the place. So maybe um, later. I, uh, well, I think we're a partner of yours on the font management side. We have some joint customers that maybe Nick after this later in the week make an introduction for me. Yep. Okay. Thank you. For a fee. <laughs> cool. you'll, get your, you'll get your cut, Nick. I'll wait. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Are there any more questions out there then, people? Cool. Oh, okay, we'll dive into a quick demo then. Um, as you all know, Matrix Store uh, under the hood. I will briefly just show you what an admin tool looks like and what it can do. Um, but more concentrating on those important um, compliance things. So Matrix Store admin tells you about the cluster, full built-in audits, all the tasks in the background, making sure that data is bit for bit perfect, as well as making sure that metadata uh, it's there as well, um, but the compliance all comes in under the vaults. So when you're creating the vaults, or workspaces or buckets within your matrix store, we've got the ability to firstly give it an uh, MD5 checksum by making sure that integrity level is hit up and strong. Then we've got the built-in trash cans to make sure nothing gets deleted by accident. So we probably want to keep it forever unless you manually purge your trash can. But then we've got this built-in compliance, this ability to make sure that data is locked for however many days you decide it needs to be locked for um, and make sure that data is bit for bit perfect that entire time. So that means if someone tries to delete something, firstly it has to age out and become that age, and then secondly it goes into the trash can and stays there until somebody, uh, an administrator manually comes along and cleans them out. Some of the other features, including those extra tombstones, making sure that extra bit of metadata, or not metadata, the extra bit of information about the, the deleted items is stored as well. Um, and then the replication, built-in replication, where again, we make sure it's bit for bit perfect in a second matrix store somewhere, uh, ensuring that data is always available to you. The other side of things is analytics, being able to see that data, um, the use of the data, the flow of the data, what's hot, what's not. Uh, and being able to see that on a cluster level, you know, hitting the statistics, seeing how many things are being read in what time periods and how your data is being used over the time as well, uh, where we could see rises and falls um, and hits to the object operations, data transfers, etc. as well as diving down into those individual vaults as well, seeing the actual vault level statistics and who's accessing what vaults in what time periods. Um, allowing us to see again how people are using the system who's hitting it what times of the day etc lastly i'll mention the the light touch into your matrix store this obviously only sees the data on your matrix store um, but it does give you a nice view into the data where you can see it um, as 
thumbnails, proxies, full search, uh, detailed searches uh, as well, should you need to, to just have a light touch into the matrix store um, to see your data, your metadata. So if I hand over to Richard now, he'll show you portfolio in a bit more detail. Um, are you ready? Yep. Good stuff. So this is actually a portfolio system that's in our matrix store lab and it's connected to a matrix store here. In fact, it's connected to this same one that I've just shown you. Um, and we've, all we've done is port forwarded the one, um, the one IP out to Richard so that he can remote from where he is and use portfolio. In fact, any of you could go to that IP address and if I gave you a user, you have access to portfolio on the matrix store there. So uh, what we're looking at here is the, the portfolio user, inter user interface that is um, either um, web-based or we do have a desktop app for it as well, um, where users can browse through the folder structure that exists. Um, the assets themselves can be tagged if I'm looking for uh, uh, a particular file, I can, I can reference that just by adding a, a description. We also have artificial intelligence to automatically add keywords, metadata, uh, onto an image. Um, they're actually displayed in green here, so I, I've added architecture, city, and travel. Uh, and you can control uh, that language as well. In terms of the search, uh, portfolio is, uh, is pretty quick. We use Elasticsearch in the back end, and you can specify a whole range of uh, uh, search criteria from Boolean or um, um, uh, um, special special um, um, wildcard searches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In addition to having a view to the folder structure as it exists on disk, one of the things that Portfolio also allows you to do is to search through a certain folder of structure. So if I highlight a folder and then search, I'm just going to search that subset rather than the entire uh, library. Um, within Portfolio, uh, we have an advanced search. So if I'm looking for um, 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 anything, any bit of metadata, I can uh, search on pretty much anything. We even count keywords. So if I'm looking from a, a sort of um, a quality control perspective, I'm wanting to um, um, make sure that every file has a minimum of five keywords, let's say. I could search for um, keywords, um, not that it starts with, but where the count is greater than five. And in this way, um, I can see that there's just one file there. If that was something that I wanted to ensure was a quality control, I could actually save that as a, a smart gallery which is items to tag. So in this way, um, it can be set up that any file coming into the library that has a minimum number of file of, of keywords uh, that we presented here, or it could be searching on a whole range of different files to ensure that metadata is added. Um, we have an API to portfolio that allows you to read and write to the database uh, to portfolio. Um, as well as um, server-side scripts, and some of Java, Java scripts to take content, publish that to social media, or to do something with those files. So concentrating on um, how people might want to uh, publish those files or make them available to other business systems. Um, in terms of uh, uh, searching, uh, we can search on document text, as I mentioned. So if I'm searching here for asset within the document rather like Acrobat you'd, you'd be able to see where those um, um, uh, words uh, were, were, were shown and then skip to the next word um, and um, yeah it's um, um, pretty quick uh, to go through uh, the system and uh, make use of all the metadata that, that, that's there. One other thing that we do with Portfolio, which is particular interest to um, uh, Blue Light, um, and this 
uh, customer that we share with Object Matrix, the, the blue light customer, is that we also have um, taken the geo metadata um, that comes with digital files to display a map view uh, within portfolio. Increasingly with um, iOS, Android photography, um, um, public supplied content, um, uh, it's useful to see where those clusters are. Um, and uh, we support um, uh, a compression technology called SID that's very uh, commonplace within um, aerial photography, satellite photography, and drone photography to actually view um, images um, uh, as they exist uh, within a map. Uh, so this is a, uh, an image that started off as a geo TIFF and allows me to, to zoom in and see this. Um, I think this is the Seattle Mariners um, uh, station. Uh, station, what am I talking about? Seattle Mariners um, um, Stadium. So uh, that's basically a, a very quick view of portfolio. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, if there's any questions, I can answer those now or invite people to contact me afterwards, and I'd be more than happy to to, to answer those questions or put you in touch with one of my colleagues in North America or uh, Asia Pacific or Europe for that matter. Please do get, it, get in contact and let us know if you have any questions uh, going forward. Thank you very much Richard for joining us today. Thank you Mark and thank you Nick. <laughs>